Okay, so good morning, everyone again. So uh, we had a very special guest today. Uh, is uh, Dr. Nascimento. Uh, Dr. Nascimento is an EEG and Epileptic uh, Clinical Fellow at uh, the uh, Massachusetts uh, Harvard. Um, and he's originally from Brazil. Uh, he uh, completed his medical school at the Universidad de Federal do Paraná. And then he spent two years uh, working at the University of Toronto as a research fellow in epilepsy genetics. And subsequently, he moved to Houston, Texas to train uh, as an adult neurologist at Baylor College of Medicine. Fabio is a very uh, passionate uh, about EEG, epilepsy, and medical education. And uh, he's going to be talking uh, about uh, something uh, that he's been working. Um, there's uh, the EEG talk, there's a uh, uh, video blog. It's a very famous. And uh, we're very uh, uh, thankful for Fabio uh, for giving us the time. And, uh, enjoy your uh, conference today so you can go ahead awesome thank you so much dr Google, for the invitation and uh everybody soon it's really a pleasure let me just share my screen here start can you guys see the slides okay yes okay great awesome yeah and just before i start i just wanted to to share that this is the very first grand rounds i'm giving so it's a extreme honor i probably remember it for the rest of my career so really really, really grateful um yeah so thanks for the introduction sergio and uh, i'll be talking a little bit about the uh, the res neurology resident eeg education and then i'll wrap up with our eeg talk um towards the last third of the talk um disclosures wise we do have some financial support for eeg talk itself but other than that <clears throat> i don't have any conflict of interest or, or any disclosures related to this and I think this is kind of important because I'm going to base the uh, the talk on on these three items here. Um, before uh, before going forward, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I don't know how Sergio is uh, wants to do it, but I'm happy to 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 get comments or questions at any time. Um, so I think three things that I wanted to to tackle today. One is to go over what we know and uh, try to uh, to confirm and, and make sure that we all are on the same page about the importance of talking about resident EEG education. The second is to really understand what's how things are out there in terms of resident EEG education, mostly in the states, but also abroad. And then the third and last point um, co covers actions that we can that we can take to improve resident EEG education. I'll show you some examples. So to start about uh, the importance of resident EEG education, I'll start with a very brief case um, uh, of a 24 year old man with this one episode of quote unquote being unable to move, feeling of warmth and shaking lasting a couple minutes with a with a brain MRI that was inconclusive. And there's this one EEG epoch that was of interest. Uh, I know we have epileptologists and, and students and residents. So just to go over it really quickly. So this is a bipolar montage. We have the left temporal chain up there. And then there's something going on in the left temporal chain in the middle of the page, right? There's, there's some sharpish looking uh, waveforms up there. If we switch to, to average, um, there's a field, meaning uh, uh, there's a, it's, its highest amplitude is at T3. It kind of affects the adjacent the neighboring electrodes or some at F7, uh, some at T5. Um, and this can be interpreted uh, very differently depending, depending on the reader and most importantly, depending on the training that this individual got. Um, so I'm going to stop there and then switch back to how we define epilepsy, because I think this is really important, especially in terms of the second criterion here. Um, as we know, back in 2014, they proposed the ILE proposed an operational criteria for epilepsy, and we know about most of this, but just want to again highlight the second criterion, which is now if you have an unprovoked seizure and your probability of having another seizure over the next 10 years is at least 60%, it already fits criteria to a diagnosis of epilepsy. So in, 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 in select cases like the one that we just, this, this one we just talked about, we have one episode the pretest probability of being seizure um, is intermediate. Um, I hope you all will agree. And uh, the MRI doesn't help, it's inconclusive. So really the diagnosis depends on the EEG. Um, so depending on how we call these waveforms, uh, it, it would change the patient's uh, diagnosis, the patient's management uh, uh, 100%. So, so very different managements. So now I just wanted to, to pinpoint an example of how a good read, an accurate and reliable EEG read can really 
uh, divide how, how patients take the next step in terms of management. Going back to this case, um, for, for us that are a little bit more familiar with EEG, these look like wickets, so non, not epileptiform. Um, so we would not call these waveforms epileptiform, it would be a normal EEG. Um, but, but some, uh, as we'll see, some without training, like I said, uh, have called these waveforms epileptiform. So I'll keep going. Um, Dr. Bemba Dees, um, who's a good friend of mine, uh, good, uh, good mentor from University of South Florida, he talks about the misinterpretation of EEG quite a bit and how that impacts epilepsy misdiagnosis. Uh, so there's a lot of papers written by him. One of them that I really like that I wanted to just briefly touch, touch on is this um, uh, overinterpretation of EEG and misdiagnosis of epilepsy where they looked at over a period of almost three years, all the PNES, so the psychogenic non-epilepsy patients diagnosed in their center. Um, a third of them had had a, a, an EEG with a quote unquote epileptiform abnormality. So they looked at it, tried to get at the actual uh, recordings, the actual raw EEG data. They were able to, to, to retrieve 15 of those records, which were all read by neurologists without um, you know, fellowship EEG-based training. And um, the overread, so they, they were all normal to start with. And the, the waveforms or the abnormalities that they thought were epileptiform were uh, wickets, just like the case that we saw, hypersynchrony, just hyperventilation slowing, and, and a lot of them just really sharply contour background. So just to highlight that it does happen out there, um, and it is, it is a problem. Um, now, one could say, why did, it doesn't matter too much. Most EEGs are read by EEGers, epileptologists, general neurologists without EEG training don't really read that much. Does it, does it really matter? Uh, and it actually does. And in the epilepsy world, um, we know because we get a lot of referrals from the community uh, where EEGs are read by general neurologists. But I like to, to talk about this paper in particular from the AEN. It's a kind of it's oldish paper now, but it surveyed a random sample of almost a thousand practicing neurologists attending the conference that year. And uh, they asked a bunch of different questions. And according to this, the, these results, the most commonly performed um, uh, procedure among the, those neurologists were, was EEG. So 60% of them uh, read EEG in a practice. Um, so just to kind of support the idea that EEGs are read by general neurologists. So I think with that, we wrap up uh, point number one. Um, it is important that residents um, are able to read independently, accurately, reliably upon graduation because a lot of them will go out and practice without the, the luxury really of getting EEG training uh, in fellowship and um, their, their reads will matter to, to patient care. Um, so I think that's one of the arguments that we make that it is important to make sure that they leave residency being able to read independently. And I know that's controversial. I'm happy to, I'm excited to hear y'all's thoughts on that. So if, if you have any questions, or I'll keep going. All right. So, so number two now. Um, so number two again. Just wanted to, to to highlight to outline a little bit of what's what's out there, and I'll talk mostly about the U.S. for obvious reasons, and then I'll touch on a little bit of Europe and uh, some Brazilian data uh, that we that we uh, got uh, a year back, a couple of years ago. So starting with the U.S., before anything, this you all are very familiar with this. Um, uh, what are the expectations of neurology residents? I think this is something that kind of is a framework to, to the entire discussion. So you know that the ACGME puts out these milestones for each particular skill, if you will, in, in neurology training. And one of them is on EEG. And they have different levels, um, all of them. And these, these are the different levels, one to five for EEG. Um, the, this document, so the, the, the ACGME will say that level four is the graduation target, meaning uh, ideally a resident will get to level four upon graduation, but that doesn't mean that if he or she doesn't get to level four, she or he cannot graduate. It's just some sort of like suggestion for graduation target. But assuming that that's the ideal scenario, uh, which I think it is, uh, that means that upon graduation, a resident will be able to really do everything at four and below. So explain the EEG procedure, use term, appropriate terminology, describe normal uh, features, dream wakefulness, uh, sleep, recognize status, common artifacts, interpret common abnormalities, create a report, recognize normal EEG variants. In other words, be able to really read EEGs independently. So that, that's the expectation according to, to the ACGME in terms of EEG. 
Uh, so that's the expectation. Now, the reality is a little bit different. Uh, I think we all know this anecdotally, uh, but there, there are papers out there to, to support our, our, our hypotheses and our and anecdotal evidence. I like to talk about mostly these two. Um, uh, this is another AAN paper where they surveyed um, more than 100 graduating adult neurologists and child neurologists, and they asked them a bunch of different questions. And one of them was whether they were confident about performing or interpreting EEGs independently. And just a little bit more than a third of adult neurologists felt, felt confident doing so. So pretty alarming um, uh, overall. Uh, better in child neurologists, but we're focusing more in the adult neurologists here and it's pretty, pretty alarming. Um, another unis, uh, a unicenter study from Dr. Weber at St. Louis University serving PGY4s only. So similar methodology here, but just one center. And um, <clears throat> a lot of them, again, were not uh, confident interpreting common abnormalities, creating a report, recognizing normal variants. So all along the same lines. Um, as a resident, just a couple of years ago, I, I decided with my mentor and friend, Dr. Gavala, to look at our cohort of 38 residents of Baylor, just to get a sense and see if we are we were in alignment with the um, other centers out there. And turns out that, that we are. Um, so this, this particular study, we, we broke down to the resident's subjective perceptions of EEG education and objective knowledge upon, uh, based on a test. And just starting with the survey, we got 28 out of 38 to respond, and almost uh, half uh, of all the residents that responded felt uh, reported not being able to read EGs, even with supervision. So it was almost half of them, and only 20%-ish um, said that they were able to write an EEG report independently. So again, pretty suboptimal um, numbers in terms of their subjective perceptions. Now, in terms of the objective, also pretty pretty a subpar um, just to organize things here. So we have the PGY ones to four down here in the x-axis and then the, the PGY one to four merged. And we have the blue guy here for the normal EEG part of the test and the, the gray for the abnormal EEG part of the test. And you can see for one to three, they're all less than 50%. So pretty, pretty not great scores. A little better at PGY fours, but still uh, pretty suboptimal. And if we merge them all, the results are pretty uh, pretty alarming as well. Um, just one point on um, the questions that they got wrong the most, because uh, I think it's a little bit concerning. Uh, in the abnormal part of the EEG, the ones that they got wrong the most were focal epileptiform discharges. So focal, focal spikes, generalized polyspike waves, and less important, but also relevant focal slowing. So in other words, they are getting a lot of, of findings wrong on the test, and some of them are very relevant. <clears throat> what we uh, we think is crucial for reading each is out there and, and take, taking care of these patients. Uh, when I gave this this lecture as slightly different, but uh, as, as my grand rounds as a PGY4 resident, one one uh, attending in the audience who shall rename and remain unnamed uh, raised his or her hand and said, hey, look, I understand. But in my experience, residents don't want to learn EEGs and you can't teach somebody something to somebody that doesn't want to learn. And I didn't say anything, but that's pretty incorrect based on the data out there. So a lot of studies have, including us here at Baylor, we have asked them whether they think it's important to learn EEG and virtually all residents said that it is uh, during residency. And they disagreed when we stated that learning EEG was just important if they were pursuing an EEG or epilepsy fellowship. So that's our core to Baylor. And then Dr. Weber's in St. Louis as well. So if we look at the same question asked for PGA 2s, 3s, and 4s, the EEGs, the blue guide there, almost all of them um, said that it is important to learn EEG. So, so that excuse, I think, doesn't apply. At least not, you can't generalize that to, to all residents. Um, switching gears a little bit to now to barriers. So what are the issues? If we're not, going, if we're not doing a good job, so what's, what's really wrong? What can we improve upon? So before we talk about actions to, to improve, what, what, are, what are the issues that we need to address? So we asked, again, back to our Baylor cohort, we asked the trainees uh, in that survey what the barriers are in, a, you know, in agreement in accordance to, to their thoughts. And um, the, the three main ones are things that we know anecdotally. There's not enough time. Uh, there's not enough time to be exposed to EEG during residency. Uh, there is this issue to, to have responsibility to read the EEG during the rotations. And there's some, some inability to link the EEG that you learn with the patients that you're taking care of. Uh, 
So that's according to the students. Um, we did a different study uh, asking a lot of questions about EEG education to program directors. We got um, 50 almost out of the 161 to respond to that survey. And uh, the, the barriers are similar. So they also said most of them, the number one was insufficient exposure um, and didactics that don't work uh, too well were, was number two. They mentioned, oops, I'll go back. They mentioned some other barriers here. They said that their inpatient workload in some centers was really high. They needed more residents. They also used that same argument that the residents don't want to learn. And um, they all, some of them also mentioned the insufficient time to teach from a faculty standpoint. But the main number two ones were, were really the exposure and the didactics not working too well. So that's, again, per the program directors. Uh, in that same program director based survey, we asked how EEG is being taught in the states and there's a lot of numbers here I don't want to go over all of them, but just a few that I think are, are important. Um, if we look at the average of one month EEG rotations required to graduate uh, in the United States that was uh, two years ago it's 1.7 so less than two months is what people usually do in terms of EEG dedicated rotations in neurology residency in the states. Surprisingly, and, and, and really with a lot of concern, it ranges from zero. So some programs that get zero, um, all the way to four months, and the median is 1.75. Um, it's mostly in the inpatient and EMU side of things, less so in the outpatient. And if we if we look at the number of VEGs read per resident per rotation, it's mostly less than 30. So a lot are in the um, zero to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30 range. So, so not enough, um, definitely not enough, especially if your average total uh, 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 rotations will be in less than two months. So they're not reading enough. Uh, now, in terms of teaching uh, didactics throughout the year and uh, during EEG rotations are the two primary methods of teaching EEG in their, in their programs. There's not a solid objective requirements to complete an EEG rotation. It ranges from completion of rotation to showing up really to oral examination and reading 30 EEGs, and more than half do not use any objective measures to assess competency, which I think is, is also an issue. So that's the states. If I'm going too fast, let me know. I tend to speak really fast when I'm excited, so, so just uh, send me a chat message and I'll slow down. So just to, to move on to, to Europe now, just to compare, uh, we did a similar, similar survey study, which is under review right now, where we, we asked different similar questions of EEG education to the 40, 47 European neurological societies, 32 of them got back to us. Um, and uh, to, to present the data, we grouped them into two groups. So one, uh, the green guy here being the countries where EEGs are typically read by general neurologists and the group two, the blue guys here are the ones where general neurologists do not typically read. EEG in the practice. And I'll just show you some of the data we got from there. This is live, but I'll kind of walk you through it. So we have different variables here. We have the US from the paper that we just talked about. So we, we know these guys already. And then we have the European uh, data. And then down here, we uh, divide it between group one, again, where general neurologists uh, do read EEG in practice and where they don't in group two. So just an overall uh, comparison here. So in terms of rotation settings, uh, whereas us in the States, we do more inpatient EEG work. Uh, in Europe, they do more outpatient. So that's one difference. The PGY level during training, I don't think it's as relevant because their duration of training is different from ours. So let's just disregard that for now. Um, primary methods of EEG teaching are similar in Europe and the States. Again, during EEG rotation and yearly didactics are the two most common ones. Barriers are the same. Um, so insufficient time, uh, EEG exposure and didactics are ineffective. So, so the same. Uh, mean number of EEG here, I, I just to, for comparison purposes, these are the weeks and not the months um, of EEG uh, re uh, weeks required to graduate. So here in the States, the 1.7 turned out to be 6.8. Whereas in Europe, for those countries where general neurologists read EEG in practice, which intuitively, and now we, we showed the EEG, uh, the resident EEG education should be a little bit more strict because 
because they're going out and, and, practi and, and practicing reading EEGs without going on uh, having a fellowship first. The number is a little bit higher, 9.2, um, and a little bit uh, lower, 7.4, for the group where general neurologists do not read EEGs in practice. And uh, still with that same thought, uh, group one, they read more than 40 EEGs uh, per rotation, um, whereas in group two, it's pretty much the same as the states, so zero to zero to 30 um, uh, mostly. And uh, in group one, uh, a third don't use any objective measures and group two, 63 uh, do not. So in other words, uh, if, if, if it's an European country where a general neurologist will read in practice, the EEG training and residency is more strict. So there's more time, they read more EEGs per rotation and they tend to use more objective measures to assess competency. Whereas if uh, general neurologists do not read EEG, it's not as strict, less time, less EEGs, and they don't really care too much about um, using objective measures. Um, so that's kind of the main, uh, main take home from, from our European data. So just uh, moving forward to Brazil now, um, and I'm from Brazil, so I wanted to see what was going on in my homeland. Uh, we got 100, 100 residents to respond. These middle grayish states here are the ones that we got participants from, and very similar data. We asked them their level of confidence reading EEG independently, regardless of their PGY year. In Brazil, there's, there's three years of neurology residency, so PGY one to three. It's essentially zero, so they're not they're, they don't feel confident reading independently. And similarly, they don't feel comfortable writing an EEG report independently, regardless of their PGY year. So that's the Brazil data. And um, so with that, I, I finish up the second point here. So we recognize the, um, the current state. So now we know a little bit about what's going on, at least here in the States, Europe, and a little bit in South America and Brazil. If you have any questions, I'll stop. If not, I'll keep going. All right, so I'll keep, I'll keep going. Uh, so the third and last point are really now that we know why it's important, um, what happens out there, including the barriers, what can we do to improve? So I, th I think this part is the most important part really for actionable things to do. Um, back to that program director based uh, study that we did, we, they proposed a bunch of solutions um, and they're pretty intuitive uh, and they go hand in hand with the barriers. So, you know, it's essentially increasing exposure, optimizing teaching and learning and optimizing measures of learning and evaluation. And I'm not going to go over all of them, but I did summarize them based on that data, on my experience and talking to a bunch of uh, smart people that are also passionate about age education. So I think this is kind of the summary slides. So I just wanted to go over this with you guys really quickly. So in terms of more EEG exposure, it's hard. Um, there's not enough time residency to do everything that we, we would like our residents to, to do. Uh, but as best as we can, I think increasing the number of rotations dedicated to EEG is really important. And uh, here, here where, I, where I train now and in my residence, former residency, uh, uh, institution, it's hard because we usually have other responsibilities during EEG rotation. So we have clinic, we have inpatient work. Um, so it's not really EEG dedicated time. And I think that's a little bit complicated because you have to pay attention. You have to read a lot of studies. So ideally it would be just the EEG. You come in, you read the EEGs, you go home without other responsibilities. Again, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's tough to accomplish that, but I think um, that would be the ideal scenario. So increasing the length of EEG rotations, which goes with, with the first point there. And as best as we can, increase exposure to EMU and LTM. Um, here, we have a lot of LTMs and our residents are exposed to LTMs. Uh, in some residency programs, uh, they don't rotate through the EMU. And I think they, they miss out on a lot of learning opportunities. I think that's where, that's where I was convinced that I wanted to do epilepsy to seeing, seeing epilepsy patients in the unit and talking to them and reading EEG and, and, and so on. So if there is a possibility to, to implement the immune rotation, I think that's really important from an educational standpoint. Um, in terms of teaching, I think that, and that's the argument I make in, in every um, uh, in a study or research that we, that we do, I think we need clear and objective teaching goals and milestones. And I don't think the ACG, and this is a personal opinion, and you, you might disagree, and I'm, I, I'll, I'll look forward to hearing your, your, your thoughts, but I don't think the milestones from ACG and me for EEG really apply. I think they're really broad. 
um, if you say recognize normal variants, but so what normal variants are you talking about? Um, there's 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 a lot out there. Which ones do they need to know, uh, regardless of them going into EEG fellowship or not? So there's a lot of things that we can improve upon, and I think that's that's something that we need to to focus on going forward. And one of the one of the objective measures that I always talk about is the minimum number of EEGs that one needs to read in residency to be to have some competency to be able to if they want uh, read EEGs in clinical practice. I don't think that number is known. Uh, it's mostly based on personal opinion, uh, but I think at least trying to come up with the number and ensuring that that's um, you know that's honored by the resident before graduating, I think, is really important. Um, optimizing the way we teach and utilizing non-traditional teaching methods, which is what Dr. Ngula was, was referring to, or EEG Talk is one of the various awesome resources out there. Uh, there, there are a lot of free, and I'll show you some examples. So trying to supplement the EEG learning and residency with, with things that are online and free, and they can do anytime, anywhere, um, I think it's, it's really valuable. Um, so I'll, I'll give some examples in just a little bit. Uh, now, in terms of optimizing evaluation, uh, similarly, I think we need better measures to assess competency. And this is something that we're working on here at the lab with Dr. Westover and Dr. Jingjing, uh, trying to come up with a test that measures skill and competency in EEG reading. I'll show you a little bit about the data that we have so far. I think it's really promising. It's really, really exciting. Um, so that's in terms of evaluation and then trying to link EG with patient care. And I, I felt that as a resident too, I, I, in, in my, again, this is anecdotal, this is personal opinion, but I felt like our, we didn't have a lot of responsibility reading EG. The fellow was reading EG for the most part. We were just there to kind of like watch over his or her shoulders. We, we didn't really write the report for the most part. So maybe just giving the responsibility to the resident, say, Hey, this is your EG. You're going to read it. And then I'm going to review it with you, uh, might be, might be a, a way to go. And then try to implement maybe EEG rounds on the inpatient side of things. I know we're all busy uh, and it might not be able to do it every week, but maybe maybe sometimes I think might be a good idea uh, in the ICU and, and in the EMU as well. I think those are, are good uh, avenues to try to, to improve how we teach and how we learn. Uh, one small-ish point about lectures, and this is something that we just uh, looked at. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting. It's really simple, but I thought it was really interesting. We tried to, to understand uh, the short-term effectiveness of, of EEG lectures uh, with the hypothesis that EEG lectures are not that great. Um, so you actually have to have as a procedure, you have to have the, you have to do it yourself kind of thing versus just sitting passively in the lecture and, and, and hearing somebody talk about EEG. Um, and so what we did was we did a pre-test and we did a, we did a post-test in our residence at Baylor back, back when I was a resident. Um, so we delivered a, a series of lectures in between the pre-test pre and post-test. Um, and then we look at the results. And um, uh, of course, they overall, if we merge all residents, they got better. So this looks significant, uh, doesn't really add too much. And um, as Dr. Roy Stroud, who's my education mentor, would say, if you teach somebody something, they will learn. There's nothing new. Uh, but I think the cool part of this study was that we, we divided the residents in two groups. So the blue group were the residents who had actually had at least some formal EEG exposure in residency. So at least some rotation of EEG versus the purple group where they had not had any EEG rotation residency. And if we look at the results, then uh, their knowledge in short term, uh, uh, in, you know, in short term, only like a month, they get better in the in the residents, the group of residents that had EEG exposure, and they don't really. There's no statistically significant difference be, uh, between the pre and post and the residents that had not. In other words, lectures are. I think lectures are great, but they might be even better if you if you're actually reviewing and recapping and refreshing people's knowledge after they know something about EEG. Uh, in, in, uh, that they did in clinical practice. So if they had a rotation and then you have a lecture, they, they're refreshed and then they, they get better and they apply that knowledge better versus people that never heard about EEG and they start watching lectures. And it's not as ben beneficial. That's just one point about, about lectures. Um, now, in terms of online resources, there's, again, there's a lot out there. Um, the ones that I like, uh, the NeuroLearn one from the AAN, I think it's pretty good for, for starters. Uh, they talk about in, uh, the basics of EEG, the, the engineering behind it. 
<clears throat> excuse me. So I think it's really good. It is paid though, but I think most of the residents have the AAN membership through the residency uh, program. So that shouldn't be an issue. I think that's a pretty good one to start. Um, the AES uh, just put out, I think a year ago, the EEG learning curriculum for residents in their website. And they have different modules for different things. So you can see here, you know, technical aspects, normal adult, normal peds, they have critical care, abnormal. Uh, and every module has lectures, and then you can actually practice on a viewer of EEG. You click on things, and then you try you try to create a report, um, and it's all free. So you just go online. You have to create a login, but it's all free. So I think this is a this is a good way to go as well uh, for residents. Uh, the ILAE has their own academy, which I think is great. Um, I think they just launched the level one. Uh, it's something to look into. I don't have a lot of experience with with their work, but um, but there's but but it's but it's it's done by great people, and and I'm sure it's it's fantastic. And then the EEG talk is is our um, is our uh, uh, online resource, which is essentially just Dr. Westover here and, and me talking about EEG. Uh, in a we try to be entertaining and funny and very. Uh, uh, to the point, they're short, and we usually bring a guest to talk about a particular topic. So we've had 20 episodes now. Again, they're free on YouTube, and um, I think it, it might supplement EJ education as well. So just another resource out there. Before I finish up, I wanted to briefly touch on our spike trial that we just wrapped up. Um, going back to that measurement of skill uh, component that I that I mentioned. Uh, we have here through Dr. Westover and Dr. Jing Jing's um, uh, work, we have a pool of thousands of, of EEGs uh, and, and candidate interictal epileptiform discharge, discharges that were labeled by a group of eight experts. So we have all those um, and we have a, a correct answer based on expert consensus. So if it's more than half of experts that said that it was a discharge, it's considered a discharge and, and, and vice versa. Um, so the idea was to use that as, as a teaching tool and, um, and to measure uh, skill. So what we did was we, we recruited residents, neurology and PEDS residents, uh, PEDS neurology residents at MG, NGB now and Yale. Um, and we got 21 to complete the whole trial. And it was pretty simple. They did a pretest at the very beginning with 500 uh, EEGs in our spike test online. Uh, and they took a survey, mostly asking about their level of confidence, identifying different things on, on EEG. And then they're randomized to control or two interventions. So the control didn't do much inactive control. They waited two to four weeks and they took the, the post-test, which was the same as the pre-test, but with different examples. So they randomly uh, pick EEGs from that thousands of uh, EEGs pools that we have here from the lab. And they took a post-survey. So that's the control group. The, the two intervention groups are similar in that they watch our EEG talk spike course lectures, which are two, three lectures online. Each is like 10 minutes or 15 minutes that we go over. Uh, the, first, the spike test, how it works, like a tutorial on the, so, on the software. Um, and then we talk about what a, what a discharge is, and especially in light of the IFCN, six IFCN criteria for defining a discharge. Um, and then we practice a little bit um, on, on that lecture. So they, they, they both intervention one and two, they watch those lectures and then they practice. So they did the same spike test, but with feedback. So they did 500 questions on the, the computer here in intervention one. They clicked on, yes, it is a spike. No, it's not a spike. And when I say spike, I refer to any epileptiform discharge. Um, and they got a smiley face if they were right and then a sad face if they're wrong. Um, and that way we try to teach in that in, in the feedback fashion, which, which was really helpful. And well, I'll show you the results. Um, for the intervention too, again, lectures were the same, but they, they practice with instant feedback on their phones. So there is this a company that works with the lab uh, that creates apps uh, and they, they uh, uploaded all the uh, EEGs that we, that we send them. And essentially it's the same thing, but they can, they can click yes or no, looking at the EEG on their phones. Personally speaking, I prefer the computer because in the computer uh, version, you can change the game, you can change the montage, uh, you, can, you can play around with it a little bit, whereas in the phone you can't, you just see one screenshot, it's fixed, and you have to say yes or no. 
uh, but it's the same overall, same idea. And once they did all that, they go back and do the post test and then take the survey. So that's the that's the design. Now I just wanted to show you really quickly here. This is a box plot of the, the difference of the accuracy of the control grouped intervention one, intervention two, and you can see the accuracy is is non statistics different uh, from pre and post for the control, but it is for intervention one, intervention two. And um, I just wanted to show you three ROC curves. Um, so just to, to recap, the ROC curves are those where you have the sensitivity in the y-axis and the false positive rate in the x-axis here. And the closer to the, the up top left point up there, the better. So th this will be a, a perfect model. Um, and if you have a straight line here, it will be a, a just by chance, 50% by chance. So it's just random. Um, so if you look at the control, um, just gonna walk you through this really quickly because I think it's really interesting. Uh, uh, so this is the control ROC curve. The, um, the, the, the pretests are the, the, the orange ones here. So the ROC curve for the pretest residents in this group is, is the orange line. And the post um, test for these residents is the blue line. So you can, you can see they're pretty uh, uh, lined up. So they're, they, there's no improvement essentially. Uh, just as a reference, the black ROC curve is the curve uh, based on the, the experts that we have that have taken the spike test. So that's our, our gold standard up there. In other words, the control doesn't get better in terms of their accuracy in ROC curves. Now, intervention one, again, the orange line is the pre-test, pre and then the blue line is a post-test after the intervention. So it does improve nicely. And, uh, and you can, we can see the, I use the, the, the area under the curve goes up and it goes um, uh, closer to the, the, the top left up there. So it's nice just to visually see their, their improvement here. And intervention two, um, I think there was a bias, although we randomized them, the, the residents in, in, in intervention two were better at, at onset before the intervention. So the, their ROC curve at the beginning was better than the other group, but they did improve as well. Uh, and we can see getting closer to the expert line um, up there. So the, um, the conclusion in, the, in this study that we're, that we're writing up at this point uh, is that a series of two short lectures, the ones on the EG talk that I told you about, in addition to practicing with instant feedback with a total of 500 questions, uh, uh, really seem to be an effective and, and well-taken method to teach both adult and peds residents with non to minimal prior experience. And that's the one point I forgot to mention. They were all PGY ones or twos. So they did not have any EEG experience prior to this, completely new to the game of, of EEG. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the conclusion uh, of what we did. Um, I kind of, I came up with a control idea. It kind of sounds a little bit dumb, but I wanted to, to make sure for future studies that just by retaking the test, they don't get better, which sometimes happens in, in different tests out there. So now I, that's the only, the other point that I, I think it's, it's helpful with this study is that retaking the spike test does not mean that they're going to improve. So in our future studies, we're not going to, we don't need a control group anymore. Um, the limitation is that it's, the sample size is pretty small uh, and the control was inactive, although it addressed that point there. So the idea now is to create a multi-center trial, uh, which um, you, you, you guys are invited to, to enroll your, your residents, um, which is going to be essentially, go back to the slide, same idea, but we're not going to have a control and the intervention is going to be merged. So we're going to have just one arm, so it's one single arm study where they, they uh, watch the lectures, they, they do, uh, they practice with feedback, 300 questions in the computer and 200 on their phones. So we're gonna merge these two here and then they take a post test at the end. So we have already 15 centers enrolled and I think we're gonna launch um, the next month or so. So we're really excited. Um, and that's it really. Um, this is my personal opinion again, before I, before I finish up. Uh, this is what I always say, although I, I know some people won't agree. Um, I think there's two ways to go in the future. Uh, one is to improve resident EEG education, which is my goal and uh, what I love to do. And I think we're doing a great job as, as a field in doing, or we really need to mandate fellowship training. Um, and you can't read EEGs in practice unless you, you do an EEG fellowship. 
uh, just to, again, with the, with the main idea, the main goal of improving patient care and making sure that who's actually signing the EG report knows in, uh, how to read the EG accurately and, and reliably. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dr. Nascimento. That was an amazing lecture. Uh, I think there are pretty, uh, a lot of questions out there. So if anyone has any questions, just like the mic is open so you can go ahead. Hey, I have a question. Um, I'm Mario, one of the chief residents. <clears throat> Thanks for your talk. Um, I, you mentioned uh, that there's really no specific number of EEGs that should be read in order to be competent, or it's not clear what that is. Um, I, objectively, sure, but what is your opinion um, on that? How, how many EEGs do you think uh, residents should be reading during residency to independently read them afterwards? Right. No, that's a great question. And before I give you my personal opinion, I'll, we, we published a paper recently with the lab here where in our spike test, the number of EEGs one needs to, to, to take on the spike test to, to get a, a performance that's almost close to the expert is 500. But that's surrounding the spike test itself, not in real clinical practice. So honestly, to, to be able to read an EEG independently, I personally think that you need at least 500 EEGs, uh, which, is, which is a lot. But then the, the kind of argument is that for a general neurologist, they're not going to be reading EMUs. They're not going to be reading a lot of LTMs. They're going to be reading routine EEGs. Uh, in that case, I think you don't need as, as many. But this is a, my opinion as a, as a fellow. So um, that's, that's my take on it. Sure, thank you. You know. Dr. Nascimento, can I ask you a question? Absolutely, uh, please. Yeah, so uh, thank you for uh, your wonderful talk and uh, I really do appreciate you trying to uh, improve education on EEG. But the, here's the central question, which, which is worse to have the resident go out into the world not trained in EEG and know that they're not trained in EEG and deferring to the expert, or the resident who's been sort of trained in EEG thinks they can read an EEG, but not they can't, and they start signing off on studies out there, which can be life and death studies in some cases. You know what I'm saying is that like you know halfway training them creates a dangerous monster sometimes. Right, 100%. I completely agree. And I've had that discussion with, uh, with Dr. Benitsky, who's one of my mentors in Europe. So I think, I think the, best, the best way, it's not going to happen, but the ideal way would be to mandate fellowship training until we improve EEG education. And once we get to a point where our residents get out of residency, knowing how to read it reliably, accurately, we can withhold that the mandate for fellowship training. I mean, just to follow up, I, yeah. I don't think it's an either or situation. I think we should continue to increase the education for EEG, for the right. competency and the day to day of, of the general neurologist. But the right. one that signs their name on the bottom line should be somebody who really knows what they're doing. So actually both right. take both roads. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point, Dr. Spar. And I think Dr. Bimba Dees wrote a paper about it. Uh, uh, kind of trying to come up with the idea that, that to have EEGs read or by a, by a supervisor, by somebody more senior, like they do with EKGs, right? So when they yeah. come into the ED, the, the EG, the emergency department physician reads the EKG and then, and then shows to the cardiologist. So I think that's what you're kind of referring to, right? Right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So also we have uh, questions that you can ask on the chat. You, someone wants to use the chat. Sorry, I, I have uh, two questions. One is, well, there, there may not be um, like a clear number of EEGs that somebody needs. There is a group of people that is in training only to read EEGs, which is fellows. And if there's a sense from, or any studies looking at that group of people on how long it takes a fellow to be competent enough that somebody would feel that this would make a very competent general neurologist in reading EEGs, if perhaps not a sub-subspecialist. 
I'm also curious if some of um, what you think may create this is a disconnect where essentially 100% of neurology residencies are done in academic centers um, where you can expect there to be a base of epileptologists. And that's very different, of course, than in a community setting. Yeah, no, no, those are great points. I'll start with the second one. I think that's it's really relevant and something that I didn't bring up, but um, in our program director survey, most of the, 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 the PDs that got back to us were from academic centers. So I think that uh, the, the data that we have for that study is, is skewed towards academic institutions. And I don't think we have a very good understanding of what happens in the community ones. And I think it does matter. So I completely agree. Um, now with the, with the, yeah, the competency, I, I completely agree. I think ideally we would have a, a test that measures skill and competency that could be delivered maybe through the ABPN, uh, bo uh, uh neurology boards, um, that somebody would need to get to the, at least, um, close to expert level to, to be able to read EEG in the practice. Um, I don't think that there is a study looking at fellows skill uh, and then correlated with the number of EEGs that they actually read during fellowship, especially because the the competency uh, test um, that I don't think I don't think it exists out there yet because of a lot of uh, issues as you would imagine. You know, gold standard, what types of study, uh, who's taking it, who's scoring it, and 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 what's covered, what's not covered, what findings need to be there, what findings don't need to be there. But uh, yeah, I, ideally, I think you're 100 right. We need a competence competency test to to divide those that are able or and not or not able to read yes hi dr Nascimento. this is uh, nick from it's actually one of the stroke physicians here uh, i have a, a two questions one a little provo provocative and the other i think more practical the mm -hmm. first is uh, what is the current status of uh, automated reading like type of uh, ai uh, reading I, probably that's uh, you know a long way uh, to to be really uh, accurate, but uh, this is uh, something that um, is uh, in the in the discussions not only for EEG but also for radiology. Let's say um, you know uh, imaging uh, readings. Mm -hmm. So that's one because if you have that, obviously, then uh, not that we are going to eliminate obviously the you know the uh, the readers and the the persons who are reading it, but uh, maybe it will will help a lot. With the clinical mm -hmm. practice and the second is you know, along the same lines mm -hmm. um you know in practical terms what we really want to uh, to you know not, not to miss the status in, in the in the you know day-to-day -day management of our patients either in the ed or in the icu and you have this uh, cerebell you know this i don't want to promote any particular products here but you have this uh, simple device that um, again uh, can uh, identify status and what is the, you know, uh, the current uh, the th thoughts about this from the EEG community? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, I'll start with the first one. I think the automated reading, it's something that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested about. And, and Dr. Westover here, that, that's my mentor, works, works on it uh, quite a bit. Um, and from a practical standpoint, I think based on my experience, we don't use it um, in clinical practice. We use some softwares to detect spikes and whatnot, but... I don't think they're at the point where we actually implement them that much in our reading uh, because there's a lot of false positives. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of issues there, but I think it's growing. And uh, especially in the ICU EEG world where, where Dr. Westover's work is mostly on, um, there are, there, I, think there, I think it's gonna change really in the next few, in the next few years. Uh, there's there's better models out there. In fact, I think they just wrapped up one study looking at the the accuracy and false positive rates and sensitivity of automated reading for ICU EEG. Having said that, though, there there is I think the trend now um, is to have these hybrid methods, which I think is what what's going to happen uh, before it becomes fully automated, where you use the the um, the model to to help the human reader uh, decide. Uh, so some of them will be automatically ruled out or ruled in, and then there's clusters of those waveforms that are kind of in, in the middle, and they're on the, the computer's on the fence about, if you will, and then the, the human reader will say, yeah, I agree, or I disagree with your read, or it is a spike, or it's not a spike. Um, so I think that's my opinion on how things are right now. 
Um, and then in terms of status epilepticus, we do have cerebral here. So we, we use, especially when, uh, when, there's, when there's tech, there's no techs uh, on call and the residents can put them on and, 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 and whatnot. Uh, my experience, which is not a, a lot, but I think that if it is status, it does pick up pretty nicely um, on, on the cerebell. And there's that sound component that helps other providers to, to, to be able to identify seizures and, or, or not. Uh, according to the studies, uh, there's, um, it, it picks up very nicely. So there's very good data out there. I'm not sure if in the real, the real world it's as good, personally speaking, but um, but for clear cut status epilepticus, I think I think it does pick up really well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and good luck with all the rest of your, uh, you know, grand rounds in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, this is Tony Wall. Um, this is Tony Wall. Just um, th thanks so much for coming in. Very interesting talk. Um, and highlights some of the uh, um, the challenges and also the uh, the work we need to do for our resident education uh, for EEG. I wonder if, if you or anyone in the audience are aware of um, similar kind of uh, training you call training gaps or uh, with practice um, standards or requirements uh, in, in areas of EMG and also maybe no imaging. I don't have a lot of experience with EMG, so I'll defer it to, to our EMGers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I uh, don't think, uh, I don't know if someone want to uh, reply to that question. Uh, maybe we can uh, leave it for later, uh, Dr. Wan. Uh, I don't see uh, someone of our attendees able to reply to that question. Okay, is there uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, I just had one question. Uh, Dr. Nascimento, it's like uh, sometimes, I, I, this is a personal opinion, sometimes there's uh, a lot of subjectivity uh, on the rain EEGs. And when I was like looking at uh, one of your presentations at the AN, it was like how you got to, to, to have like different like uh, experts, uh, readers. And sometimes it's very difficult to pick out the, uh, the final read on EEGs on, uh, based on the subjectivities. I need like inter-individual, uh, uh, inter kind of like, um, uh, study that comment on the, on the spec readings or uh, and what is your idea about like the your um, uh, the EEG talk trying to improve these different like uh, uh, readings uh, between as experts in actually like people that are trying to get better at EEGs. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's that's a that's a great point. It's something that we have a lot of uh, material on that we study quite a bit. Uh, I think especially when it comes to identifying epileptiform discharges, there's, there's a lot of um, issues in terms of subjectivity. I completely agree with you, even even among experts. And can you imagine even more among trainees? And it's hard to learn. Um, so Dr. Uh, Benitsky's group, uh, based on the uh, International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology, did a very nice study and validated the, the IFCN criteria for identifying epileptiform discharges. Um, so there's six of them, uh, and they're pretty straightforward. And it's a matter of counting how many a particular candidate a discharge has, and then making a decision based on, based on that. And um, Dr. Benitsky's group showed that if you teach trainees those criteria, um, and then and then retest them. Their inter-rater agreement and their overall accuracy improves significantly. So it's one of the one of the things that I am really excited about, and I think we should use. And that's what actually what we use in the spike trial study that we're going to use in the multi-center spike trial. Uh, it's trying to break down the judgment of a waveform being epileptiform discharge or not to six small steps, uh, and so you you make six decision smaller decisions. Uh, and then you count them up, and if they if they um, go through the uh, past the threshold of four out of six, you call it a discharge. Um, so I think that's a pretty nice way of 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 really teaching trainees mostly, and even among experts. You know, in our conference, 
Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you guys have the same uh, mechanism there. When there's tricky cases, the attendees will say, huh, I don't think that's a discharge. And the other will say, yeah, I think it is a discharge. And then somebody will say, oh, let's use the criteria. And then we go over the criteria and then we kind of come up with a consensus judgment based on that. So it's a great, great question. Okay. Um, I have a quick question. So I uh, thank you, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, just, um, just as like a suggestion, I was thinking like some of our attendings when, you know, they do the report for EEGs, they include some snapshots or pictures of like, you know, the abnormal findings. Mm -hmm. How uh, much do you think that could help, like for residents, uh, when let's say we're reading the report of our patient's EEG, to actually at the same time have like a snapshot of that abnormal finding that uh, was, you know, found uh, so that to have that more common, um, you know, in the reports or put it like um, included as a, like a, you know, something that um, we routinely see mm -hmm. um, in like make, to make us like more familiar with um, basically what they look like and, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think that's great. It's something uh, I do, and I think a lot of uh, the attendings and fellows here do, especially in the tricky cases, including a, a screenshot on the report. I think it helps it helps a lot. And I would go even one step farther. It's saying that um, I think some some will say, you know, there's a sharply contour waveform that's suspicious, not definite, uh, not definitely epileptic form. But in addition to stating that, I think maybe going over the the you know the characteristics of the waveforms that you think are suggestive of being a depth left from discharge or not, I think would be helpful too, just to, especially for a trainee. And then you get that, 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 that mindset of going over the six IFCN criteria and seeing which ones are present and which ones are absent and then base your conclusion uh, off of, off of that. Um, but yeah, but you're right. Including a screenshot will answer all those questions and, and you can just look at it and, and, and make up your mind in terms of the, the criteria. So hundred percent, I think that's a very good idea and very good point. Thank you. Great. Is there any uh, other question from the audience? Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Nascimento, uh, it was a very nice time. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, really like, thank you for accepting the invitation and sharing uh, your experience uh, in education in EEG with us. And uh, I think like we're gonna uh, see you again in the future. Like uh, we're gonna see how you're gonna help us more in the community. This is a really, uh, wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation again. I appreciate it. Thank you everybody for, for attending and uh, yeah, have a great day. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye everyone. See you next Friday. Bye. Thank you.